Coming up Sunday night on the attorneys, Carter Clay of the firm Hollis Wright going to be uh, spearheading a conversation we're having about workers' comp. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting topic. We're going to have Greg Denny of Powell and Denny Law Firm. He's a local attorney. He's been specializing in handling workers' compensation for injured workers for about 20 years mm -hmm. now. He does a great job for his clients. We're going to be kind of telling the viewers if they're injured on the job, what they can expect from the process, what benefits they can expect, what they should do, what they shouldn't do, what doctors they're allowed to see, what doctors they're not allowed to see. We're going to talk about some time limitations relative to the statute of limitations and deadlines in terms of notifying your employer of the on-the-job injury. We're going to cover a lot of ground and it's going to be a good, yeah. good topic. A lot of ground, a pretty complicated, complex area as well. So be sure to join us, Carter. We'll see you Sunday night. See you then. We'll see you then right after the uh, news right here on WBTM 13 News. We'll see you on Sunday. Car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. We appreciate you spending your Sunday evening with us for the next half hour. We've got a panel of experts here to answer your questions the way that you can get those questions into us. Call, text, email that information at the bottom of the screen all throughout the evening. Also, an attorney is standing by right now to take your call. So please take advantage of that unique opportunity. Leading our conversation tonight, as he often does, from the firm of Paulus Wright, Carter Clay. Good to see you, sir. Good evening to you and good to see you as well. Hope you're doing well. Doing very well. Looking forward to our conversation. Tonight. Yeah, we're going to be talking about workers' compensation. Uh, and benefits that injured workers can expect to receive if they are unfortunately injured uh, in an accident while right. working. And that's what the topic that we're going to be covering here tonight. And as part of kind of getting ready for the show, I wanted to look at some statistics to kind of see how we were doing in Alabama and nationwide relative to uh, injuries on the job and deaths uh, caused by injuries on the job. Uh -huh. And in 2013, there were 40, approximately 4,400 fatalities uh, throughout the country stemming from on-the-job accidents. And here in Alabama in 2013, there were roughly about 66 fatalities from on-the-job accidents. Wow. And interestingly enough, we've been trending in the right direction. There's been a significant downward trend from uh, fatalities in Alabama as the result of on-the-job accidents over the last 10 to 15 years. I think the highest was around 150 fatalities back in the mid-90s. So we're doing a better job, I think, in terms of protecting the injured worker. Mm -hmm. And with the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, with OSHA, their enforcement uh, t uh, uh, divisions that they have that come out and conduct investigations with companies being more proactive in terms of implementing policies and procedures relative to on-the-job safety matters. Uh, we're doing a better job, but we still have a, a lot of room to go uh, in terms of protecting injured workers, and I think those statistics kind of highlight that right. fact. And uh, fortunately with us here this evening, we've got Greg Denny. He is a local outstanding attorney with the uh, Powell and Denny Law Firm. And I wanted Greg to come on the show because Greg's firm specializes in handling uh, workers' compensation cases and in representing individuals who are injured on the job. He's an outstanding attorney. He and his partner, William Powell, they do a great job for injured individuals. So I really wanted him to come on the show and tell us a little bit about uh, this area of the law. So Greg, uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, Carter. I really appreciate it. Well, well you're certainly welcome. Uh, let's just jump right into it. And first, let me ask you, uh, in terms of workers' compensation, how do the laws in Alabama relative to workers' compensation and the benefits that injured workers can expect to receive, how do they compare to other states? Are we at sort of the low end of the totem pole in terms of benefits in the middle or on the high end? We're on the low end. Uh, Alabama workers' compensation law has not really been addressed or changed since the early 90s, and even that was only a series of amendments. Uh, it's really stuck back in the 1980s. Uh, other than the medical benefit, which in Alabama is actually fairly good, you have lifetime medical benefits, the actual pay rate that people are paid at for permanent injuries is, is the lowest in the United States. And when we talk about the workers' compensation laws, uh, laws are typically created by, through the courts, through the judicial system, or they can be created by statute. Is 
the workers' compensation law in Alabama, is it a statutory-based law? It is a statutory-based law. About 100 years ago, uh, most states in the United States enacted uh, a workers' compensation uh, system as part of the Industrial Revolution. The changing workforce and the relationship between employers and employees created that system. However, uh, the manner in which somebody can get hurt in a workers in a work situation is almost infinite. Unlike a car accident case where almost all car accident cases share something in common, workers' compensation cases are, are dramatically different in each situation, it seems like. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, current sitting Court of Civil Appeals judges in Alabama wrote a treatise before he took the bench, and it's 1,500 pages long which essentially is 1,500 pages of case law. So yes, it's statutory in nature, but due to the nature of workers' compensation itself, you have quite a few cases and the law changes almost from day to day. Yeah. Are, are all workers or employees covered by these workers' compensation laws in Alabama? And if not, who can expect to be covered and who is not covered? For all intents and purposes, almost everyone is covered in Alabama. Uh, anyone who has, any employer who has five employees is legally required to carry workers' compensation coverage. So uh, other than the most, the smallest of businesses and in some agricultural situations, uh, virtually everyone's going to be covered. What about governmental employees, city and municipalities, counties and things like that? Some cities uh, do have workers' compensation coverage. A lot of cities actually do, but the state has its own system that it operates and under. And, uh, entities that are part of the state, such as uh, uh, certain universities, uh, they also are part of that state system and would not file a standard workers' compensation claim. What does the term arising out of employment mean? Well, of the 1,500 pages I uh, discussed earlier, there are several hundred pages discussed with that. Really? Uh, arising out of... Uh, the Lawyers have a tendency to complicate things. <laughs> <laughs> you can have that many pages from arising out of the employment. It's the, it is one of the most litigated issues, is determining how and when an accident is actually related to the job and thus a workers' compensation claim. For instance, when I was coming over here today, I walked out of my office and a wasp came close to me and almost chased me down a little ramp leading out of my office. Now, that, if I had been stung and fallen, would be the kind of thing, in theory, that could be litigated and discussed in workers' comp as to whether that arose from my employment on my trip over to uh, the uh, uh, studios. Yeah. Yeah, another example of that would be we, everybody has a house. When you leave your house in the morning to drive to your work, if you get injured in an automobile accident while driving to your work, is that arising out of your employment? Because you have to get from your house to your work. Yeah. The answer to that is no. Uh, uh -huh. That's not going to arise out of your employment. So you can go through these exercises and think mm -hmm. of many, many examples. Yeah. Um, and it's not only how you're injured, but the type of injury that you have. For instance, say, uh, for, for instance, uh, you have a heart attack while you're working. Um, is the heart attack, did it arise from your employment? Well, naturally, your impulsive response might be, well, no. Well, there are some jobs out there that are so stressful that have certain aspects to them that can actually cause you to have, be a risk factor for a heart attack. And in those instances, the heart attack may have arisen out of the employment. So there are all kinds of examples in that regard. Even the example you gave of the phone call or, or going to work, uh, it, what if uh, your employer called you on your cell phone while you're sitting in your car and directed you to a different place than you originally intended to go? Kind of on so, the job then, aren't exactly. You? So that's the that's the variations in workers' comp are strange and numerous, yeah. and that's how you get 200 pages worth of that <laughs> right. one issue in the in the tree. Easy, easy to do. Uh, when we come back, uh, let's go ahead and take a break. When we come back, this question: I've been injured on the job. What type of benefits am I entitled to? I bet there are a couple of uh, responses and, and some ground to cover there. We'll dive into that question when we come back. As we head to break, a reminder of how you can join the conversation: call, text, email. Uh, you can also find the firm of Hollis Wright on Facebook if you'll just search that term and on Twitter it is Hollis underscore Wright. Stay tuned more of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Carter Clay with the law firm of Hollis Wright. Thanks for watching the attorneys on WVTM 13. Now we hope you, a friend or a loved one, never need legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of this show is simple to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to this show or related to other specific legal matters,
Call, email, or text us to talk with one of our lawyers. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter to learn about important legal news that could affect you or your family. Or simply contact us by going to WVTM13.com and click on the attorney's link. Now we know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and for watching the attorneys right here on WVTM 13. Uh, those firm facts just put it right out there. Welcome back into the attorneys. I appreciate you being with us. Call, text, email that information at the bottom of the screen. Would love to have you get your questions into us. A question we have here. I've been injured on the job. What types of benefits am I entitled to? Basically, uh, the first thing you want to do when you're injured on the job is give your employer notice so that you can get medical benefits. That's mm -hmm. your primary right under workers compensation is to get treated for whatever injury you have. Uh, if it's a serious injury and you're going to be off any period of time, you'll be compensated for your temporary uh, missing of work or ability to earn. And that mm -hmm. rate is at 60% of what you used to earn while you were working. So during that period, you'll, which uh, typically lasts several weeks for a lot of, of, of injuries, you'll get what's that temporary benefit. Then at a later point, when the doctor has determined that you've reached what's called maximum medical improvement and that there's not that much more assistance or treatment that the doctor can render to you that will be beneficial, uh, it, then you turn to your permanent uh, disability benefits. Okay. So if you're not able to return to work in the capacity that you were prior to the injury, then there's an assessment that's done to determine what kind of problems you're going to encounter when you do return your to your job physically. And that's where, when we opened the conversation, we talked about how Alabama's on the low end. That's the place where a lot of Alabama workers uh, do encounter some problems because they're compensated at an extremely low rate. Right. As a matter of fact, they're compensated now for their permanent injury at a rate that is below minimum wage. Mm. Wow, wow. Yeah, talk a little bit more uh, specifically about the temporary benefits that one would expect to receive if they're injured and they're off work. Are they going to get paid their full a salary or full hourly rate, what do they actually get paid? They get two-thirds of what they were uh, uh, paid on, on an average week working for their employer. The theory behind this has to do with the fact that you're not going to pay taxes on that, on that so that in, in, in theory you should be making about the same take-home pay as you were when you were working. Um, the problem is, is that uh, it's probably the most common problem I encounter in my day-to-day -day affairs as a workers' comp lawyer is, is the payment of the check, making it from the insurance carrier, the employer, to the injured employee is not as consistent as one would hope it would be. So someone sitting out there, they're unable to work, they're not getting their full wages, and they're uh, getting a check that uh, if they get it irregularly, they're not getting it every week, or getting it every two weeks like they're used to getting, that can call, cause massive problems. And from, you know, for most Alabama workers who are living paycheck to paycheck, uh, getting that 60% irregularly can be uh, the primary issue they face in a workers compensation claim. Yeah, and, and David, one interesting thing about the workers compensation law, and Greg, I want you to talk a little bit about this, is it's a little bit insensitive, but if you actually look at the workers compensation statute, they actually put dollar figures on body parts. And oh, they call them scheduled versus unscheduled injuries. And talk a little bit about a scheduled versus unscheduled injuries and how they lay that out in the statute. Yeah, it, when you get out of law school and you first look at that, it's sort of look at, like looking at some kind of horror movie. Uh, arms listed, a legs listed, a fingers listed, and then a calculation that allows you to determine the amount of money that you should be paid for that. Uh, is uh, given to you. The attorney can, or, or uh, unrepresented person can fig try to figure that sort of thing out and come up with a dollar amount for what their finger is worth or what their eye is worth. As we sort of alluded to earlier, in Alabama it's, worse, it's worth less than it is in other states due to the way these things are calculated. So in a nut, for instance, Georgia or Tennessee, which have uh, systems that pay at a higher rate, you're, if you lost your eye, for instance, it would be paid much more money for that eye in another state than you would in Alabama. So there's that discrepancy that uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, another thing that's interesting about it is, is that 
uh, when, you, when you sit down and look at the schedule itself and try to figure out why is this, why is this horror show the case, well, again, you think back to when this was all uh, conceived back 100 years ago. Most workers worked in industrial situations and complete amputations uh, were very common during that period and thus that list made a lot of sense back then, whereas now it's, it's sort of an anomaly in the way um, it appears. So when you hear that something costs an arm and a leg that you can find out the actual going rate now. So. Yeah, and workers' compensation is also a bit unique, and I want to make sure that the viewers fully understand this, and that is that workers' compensation is not a fault-based system. In almost every other aspect of civil litigation and throughout our judicial system, if somebody's injured, in order for you to be compensated, you have to prove that somebody else was at fault for your injury. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in workers' compensation at all. It is not a fault-based system, and, and speak to that issue just a little bit. Yes, as, again, as uh, workers' comp was originally conceived, the idea behind it was is to keep employers and employees from debating these issues or filing lawsuits against each other which might for instance close an entire business. So caps were put on the amount of money that uh, employees could recover. At the same time uh, the employee no longer had to prove the negligence of the employer. So basically uh, we get back to arising out of the course of employment. The reason that's so important is, is really what you have to prove in a workers compensation case is that you were hurt because you got it arose from the job that you were doing. Right. As long as that's the case, even if it, it was your own fault, you would still be uh, due coverage. So for instance, if my job involved me driving, say for some type of company, I had to drive throughout the course of the day and I make a mistake or I'm negligent and I run a red light and I hit a telephone pole and I get hurt, is that gonna be compensable? compensable? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the car accident cases that arise in workers' comp are some of the most complicated workers' compensation cases you can have because you have various insurance coverages. You have your employer's own insurance, you have your own insurance which can come into play, the other driver's insurance. Situation you gave where there's a telephone pole, uh, it could be design issues about how the roadway was designed, all kinds of things that can arise from that, but yes, uh, plenty of people, their job is to get into a vehicle and drive around. Now, uh, going back to the example you gave earlier, however, if you're stopping at a pharmacy in order to pick up your child's uh, prescription drug medication or, or a spouse's prescription, then that wouldn't necessarily be covered because you had gone on an errand that benefited yourself. Right, all right. Uh, time for us to take our final break of the evening. A few minutes remaining. If you want to get your question in, call, text, email. We'd love to hear from you. Also, the opportunity to speak live with an attorney when you pick up the phone and make that call. Stay tuned. The final segment of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright. Now we often hear the phrase burden of proof when it comes to civil or criminal lawsuits. It's the level of proof that a plaintiff must meet to win their case. But these burdens change whether you're in a civil or a criminal court. So in this week's Legal 4-in-1, we're answering the question, who holds the burden of proof and what is the burden in the case? Let's start with civil cases. Civil cases are brought by a plaintiff who claims they have been injured by some way by a defendant. Because there is no chance of jail time, since the injury does not amount to a crime, the burden of proof is not as difficult as in criminal cases. The level of proof here is called preponderance of the evidence. In general terms, that means the plaintiff must prove that it is more likely true than not true that the defendant is responsible for the plaintiff's injuries. You've seen the scales of justice before. Both parties have to fill those scales up with evidence to support their position. If the plaintiff can fill his scale up with just a bit more evidence than the defendant, the plaintiff wins the civil case and is entitled to a verdict. Now the stakes are much higher in a criminal case than that of a civil case. That's because a criminal defendant could lose his freedom or even his life if he's found guilty. So who holds the burden of proof in a criminal case? Well, the state does because the defendant is being accused of breaking state law. The state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. It's the heaviest burden in the justice system. The evidence has to be so convincing that the jury believes beyond any reasonable dispute the defendant is guilty. Probably guilty just isn't enough in these cases. The law requires the jury to find the defendant not guilty 
if there is any doubt at all. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Welcome back into the attorneys, the final segment right here. So if you got a question you want to get to us, go ahead and take advantage of uh, the information at the bottom of your screen to get those questions to us. A uh, question we have here about uh, using the company's doctor. Am I required to visit the company's doctor um, whenever you're filing a, a worker's comp claim? Uh, in theory, you could go see your own doctor. However, that's not the way it really works. The okay. law requires you to, to come under the umbrella of worker's compensation. Your employer or their carrier gets to choose where you go. It doesn't prevent you from seeing your own doctor, but most people don't have the ability to pay for that and their own private insurance is not going to pay for them to see something where workers' co comp coverage is at play. Okay. So as a matter of uh, course, yes, you are going to have to go see the company's doctor in order to get treatment for your work injury. What happens if you don't uh, like the company doctor or you don't think you're getting appropriate treatment, what are your options at that point? There's a, an ability to choose from a list of uh, four other doctors, which you can, uh, in most cases, you only get to bring up one time. I would say that that is uh, probably the decision that most people make the biggest mistake on in all of workers' comp, is that they choose from that list based on proximity to their house, some knowledge with the facility. Mm -hmm. If you ever needed to call a lawyer on a workers' compensation claim, it would be when you're presented with a panel of four and you don't know those four doctors. because. Most workers' comp lawyers are going to know those four doctors and are going to be able to give you an opinion on each one of them. Right. Greg, you mentioned something earlier that I want to touch upon again because I think it's critically important. You mentioned that injured workers uh, are eligible for lifetime medical benefits. What does that mean exactly? It used to mean a lot more than it does nowadays. Uh, it basically, uh, the law it, it gives you the ability to go see a doctor for the rest of your life for your work-related injury. However, what's happened over the last decade or so is that insurance carriers have looked with greater scrutiny as to what was originally related to that injury. So if you have a problem, in theory, when the law was uh, passed, uh, in, in the past you, you would look at going to see a doctor maybe 10 or 15 years for your back injury, and as long as it was related to your workers' compensation claim, you would get treatment. That was the theory behind the law at that point. However, what's happened now is, is that you will typically be interrogated and asked questions about, well, what did you do this past weekend? Did you lift a couch? What have you, what's, what's happening at your new job? And um, that benefit is not as valuable as it once was. Yeah, the other caution that I would give a viewer out there that's been injured is, is a lot of times because Alabama allows for lifetime medical benefits, these workers' compensation carriers will come in and attempt to settle the lifetime medical benefit by paying them an additional lump sum amount of money in exchange for them releasing the comp carrier mm -hmm. from any further medical benefits and that gets really complicated it can really jeopardize your ability to get treatment some insurance companies Medicare uh, will refuse to provide coverage for that on the job injury if you do right. that so you need to be real careful about engaging in that kind of conduct. A question here about statute of limitations relative to workers' comp cases? Yeah, statute of limitations in any area of the law can get fairly complicated uh -huh. because it can mean that your case is over with forever if you do not file your claim in a timely fashion. Right. Workers' comp is particularly uh, difficult though because it gets it, your statute of limitations gets extended based on getting paid for your work-related injury. So. Uh, whereas in most cases would end in a two-year period, uh, depending on how long you got paid for being off work, you might have a longer period of time uh, to file your claim. So that would be something you would definitely want to consult with an attorney about. You might think that, well, it's been over two years since I was injured, there's nothing I can do. Uh, that might not be the case, especially if you were paid uh, temporary benefits. Yeah. yeah. For the injured worker out there that needs a lawyer, wants to hire a lawyer, but is thinking, I just don't have the funds or the money to hire a lawyer, tell the viewers a little bit about how workers' compensation attorneys get paid. Uh, workers' compensation attorneys get paid uh, on a contingency basis, so uh, um, that lawyer will not get paid a dime unless they make a recovery for you. 
uh, the fee is 15%, and I constantly am reminding my clients that that is basically tip money. That's the same as you would pay a waitress for service, and that's a, a running joke actually amongst many workers' compensation lawyers. But uh, unlike a lot of other areas of the law, workers' compensation is overlooked by the state in a way to where judges come into play and uh, even some government officials look over the pay that is made to the attorney in a workers' compensation situation, and you're guaranteed a level of protection there that you aren't in, in certain other areas of law. And I think from my point of view, that would inspire me to go get counsel because really what you're looking for now is experience. You don't have to worry so much about your trust level, although that's important, but the way workers' compensation is done, if you go to get a, an attorney and they know what they're doing, uh, you're, you're probably getting a pretty good deal. Right. All right. A question we have here, is it possible to not only have a workers' compensation claim but also a third-party claim as well due to a workplace injury? Oh, yes, uh, and uh, that's something Carter would uh, be very familiar with that he would handle a lot of is if you do broader uh, tort litigation, broader personal injury litigation, uh, there's almost any scenario that you can imagine where there's a work injury, there can also be a third party claim. Right. However, it can get very complicated. Those cases need great scrutiny because different insurance companies will make different payments and a lot of times an injured worker will think, well, I've gotten this money, my case is resolved, and then they'll settle their third party claim and then money will, might be owed back to their employer. Right. Where that money comes from and where that money goes and how it's attributed and allocated uh, is the t type of thing that keeps Carter and I up at night. Yeah, and just to give you a couple of classic examples of how you can have a workers' compensation claim and what we call a third-party claim. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, somebody's uh, injured while using a product or a tool. They would have their workers' compensation claim against their employer for workers' compensation benefits, but let's say that the product or tool they were using was defective in some manner. A lawyer could potentially pursue a product liability or product defect claim against the manufacturer. And then we also see it a lot of times in construction-related accidents where an employee of one contractor is injured as a result of the conduct of another contractor's employees, they right. can have workers' compensation over here and pursue a negligence claim against the other contractor. Uh, less than two minutes remaining, time enough for a final thought from the both of you. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and just start with you. Your final thought for our viewers. Well, I, I think workers' compensation, uh, what we've discussed today, you can come away with this, is that it's uh, changing, it constantly changes. It's confusing. It's not the kind of subject anybody would be interested in unless they're injured at work or they're an attorney who's involved with it. And uh, it's the kind of thing you really need consultation on, and uh, it's, it's low risk to have that consultation. Right. Right. Workers' compensation is amazingly complex because the concept of it sounds pretty simple and straightforward. I, I have a job, I'm injured on the job, these are my injuries, this is what I need medical treatment for, this is what my wages or I get two thirds of my average weekly wage. But I think as we've established here this evening, there are so many nuances and complexities with handling and evaluating a workers' compensation claim that it, it is of utmost importance to get legal counsel right. uh, from the outset to make sure that the workers' compensation carrier is doing what they're supposed to be doing on your behalf. Good advice. Appreciate both of you being with us. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us as well. We appreciate the time each and every Sunday evening as we wrap things up. Here's how you can get in touch with the firm of Hollis Wright. Feel free to do so. We look forward to hearing from you. We'll see you next week right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright.